Our chairman, he can go ahead and do whatever he wants. You got about two minutes to get in your chair. Just want to say good morning, and uh, I guess I better officially bring this meeting to order. I can't tell you, uh, this is off script, so if I do something wrong, GT, the chairman of our Ag Committee will straighten me out, but, you know, I can't tell you, this is a sincere comment, I can't tell you how excited I am to have the expertise we have as witnesses here today, and we're really looking forward to interacting with you and have your expertise as we uh, move forward to try to do the farm bill. And so the input you have about research and so on is extremely important. And so, uh, so uh, with that, um, I want to bring the committee to order. Better put my glasses on so I make sure I'm on script now. But anyway, um, the title of this hearing is a review um, of the research and the, and the Title Seven University Perspectives on Research and Extension Programs. And so after we have some brief opening remarks, uh, the members will have an opportunity to receive testimony from our witnesses, and uh, then the hearing will be open to questions in, from the members of, of the committee. So in consultation with ranking member, and pursuant to Rule 11E, I want to make the members of this subcommittee aware that other members of the full committee may join us today. And in case you hadn't picked up on it, G.T. Thompson, the chair of our Ag Committee, is with us. It's good to have you with us, G.T. Appreciate it. So with that, uh, I would like to make an opening statement, if you'll permit me. Uh, and then the ranking member would like to have an opening statement, and then we'll move to testimony. So, uh, you know, today's hearing is about agricultural research, and all of our witnesses are experts in that field. And extension activities across the nation's universities. And as a three-time graduate of land-grant universities and a former extension agent, this is an issue near to my heart, and I'm looking forward to the discussion today. When USDA was created by President Lincoln in 1862, the primary objective of the department was to acquire and to diffuse among the people of the United States useful information on subjects connected with agriculture. And that continues to be a, a paradigm for, for today. Just months after creating USDA, President Lincoln signed the Morrell Act of 1862 establishing the land-grant universities in each state and to teach agriculture and mechanical arts. Today, the land-grant universities have a mission that is threefold, to provide instruction, conduct research, and disseminate the instruction and research throughout each state through the Cooperative Extension Service. To ensure, to ensure equitable access, Congress later expanded the land-grant system through the Morrell Act of 1890, which established historically black colleges and universities and the, and the Equity in Education Land Grant Status Act of 1994, which conferred land grant status to several tribal colleges and universities. While Cooperative Extension Service is unique to 112 institutions in the land grant system, other colleges and universities also carry out important agricultural research and teaching activities Recognizing the role of other universities, the 2008 Farm Bill included provisions to identify non-land-grant colleges of agriculture, NLGCAs, and Hispanic-serving agricultural colleges and universities, HSACUs. Together, these institutions help educate 
the next generation of agriculturists and perform the research necessary to keep our American agriculture at the forefront of productivity. Many of the programs that provide capacity and competitive funding for these institutions are authorized in the research title of the Farm Bill. However, today's remarks marks the first time the House Committee on Agriculture has received university research and extension programs since the passage of the Agricultural Improvement Act of 2018. When this subcommittee met a few months ago to hear directly from the USDA on research program efficacy, we discussed how agricultural research has yielded our economy $20 for every dollar spent. I want to repeat that, $20 for every dollar we spend on agricultural research. An impressive statistic, despite public spending for agricultural research declining since 2002. At the hearing, we also heard about the backlog of deferred maintenance on research facilities across the nation. To remain competitive with our country, with other countries, the United States cannot forget the role of agricultural research and the important aspect that it plays in ensuring Americans have the safest, the most abundant, and the most affordable, most affordable food, fiber, and energy supply in the world. Today's hearing presents us with an opportunity to hear directly from all three types of land grants, a non-land grant college of agriculture and a Hispanic servicing agriculture college or university. I'm looking forward to hearing about success stories from investments in agricultural research, challenges facing our institutions of higher education, and how the next Farm Bill can continue to support the great work they're doing. Today's hearing also gives us a chance to review the research title and examine the opportunities for efficiencies among the many programs for re up for reauthorization. While not every program in the title receives subsequent appropriations, it is worthy noting that NIF has over 60 unique funding lines that do not receive appropriations each year, raising questions on necessity and where opportunities exist to streamline. I would like to thank the witnesses for taking time to be here with us today, and I'm especially excited to see Dr. Bernie Engel from one of my alma maters, Purdue University, if you'll allow me, on today's panel. Just last week, Dr. Engel was selected to be the next Glenn W. Sample Dean of Agriculture at Purdue University. Congratulations on your appointment, and thank you for being here today. With that, I will recognize the ranking member, Spanberger, for any opening remarks she would like to make. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, too, am an alumna of Purdue University. That was where I got my graduate degree. So fun coming together, if you will. Thank you, Chairman Baird. I am excited to be here with you for another subcommittee hearing to focus on research in the Farm Bill. I look forward to collaborating with you to support universities from Indiana to Virginia. And I'm excited to have a representative of Virginia Tech, Dean Allen Grant, here to be part of this conversation. I also look forward to hearing from our witnesses today about how agriculture programs at colleges and universities throughout the country are conducting research to directly address the challenges faced by U.S. farmers, build more resilient food systems, respond to workforce challenges, and promote U.S. global competitiveness. Today we'll also hear testimonies on the needs of these research programs and how we can ensure the investments in this year's Farm Bill are responsive to the institutions that are on the front lines of this research. Public investment in agricultural research is critical to the success of American agriculture. Research, development, and technological advancements have increased crop yields and improved crop resiliency in the United States relative to other nations. However, U.S. agricultural research funding is not currently keeping pace with competitor nations. China is now outspending the United States by more than two to one on public agricultural research. A safe and resilient food supply is critical to both maintaining American farmers' competitive edge over other nations and promoting U.S. national security. We must view agricultural research investments as part of a broader U.S. effort to promote American competitiveness globally as well as support our farmers locally. 
Back home in Virginia, I have heard from farmers and our institutions of higher education about the critical nexus between research and the success of Virginia's number one private industry, agriculture. I hope this hearing will build on the great discussion that I had at my Farm Bill Summit in April, where we had panelists from Virginia Tech and Virginia State University discuss their work on research, workforce development, and the cooperative extension system. I am amazed by the critical work done at universities in Virginia, with our land-grant universities collaborating with USDA to complete cutting-edge research. At Virginia Tech, professors and students are focused on research and grants to help farmers implement climate-smart practices, promote the Virginia seafood industry, improve pest management tools, and so much more. At Virginia State University, professors and students work on research to minimize crop losses from pests, advance specialty crops, uh, and improve soil and water quality, just to name a few. We then see research results put into action through extension. And I am proud of Virginia's unique extension system, where Virginia Tech, our state's 1862 land-grant university, and Virginia State University, our historically black 1890s institution, collaborate to administer extension services in every county. I believe collaboration between research institutions and extension educators strengthens the service and perspective provided to farmers across our commonwealth. Our extension system proves time and time again that investment in universities and research directly translates into investments in farmers and our rural communities. Seeing this collaboration in action reaffirms my commitment to investing in all types of agricultural research programs, from the original designated land-grant universities to minority-serving institutions to non-land-grant colleges of agriculture. All of these institutions are critical for training the next generation of agricultural workforce and promoting U.S. agriculture's competitive edge over other nations to ensure that our farmers can thrive. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. The gentlelady yields back. And uh, now I would like to move to the chair of our agricultural committee, the full committee, and let him have the opportunity to make opening comments. Well, Chairman Baird, thank you very much. Good morning, everybody, and, and thank you. Uh, thank you to Chairman Baird and Ranking Member Spanberger for convening this uh, really important hearing. Uh, if, uh, if the farm bill that we're working on is, uh, uh, will obviously serve the, those in America's number one industry, agriculture, uh, from 2023, when we get this done, to 2028, our, but what we need to do is make sure we're creating a platform for the future, uh, for what's over the horizon. And, uh, and that starts with great uh, institutions uh, that are, uh, are, who are educating and preparing uh, the best and the brightest uh, to be able to lead and, uh, and to be centers of, of uh, exploration and science and technology uh, to be able to develop those tools uh, that we need today, and quite frankly, we'll need even more uh, tomorrow and in the future. And so, you know, since the 1940s, American farmers, ranchers, and foresters have increased agriculture uh, outputs nearly threefold uh, with little to no change in inputs. Just tremendously remarkable. Nobody does it with more efficiency and more, more productivity anywhere in the world. Uh, this is an impressive statistic that would not be possible without federal and state investments in cutting-edge research conducted at our land-grant and non-land-grant colleges of agriculture. These advancements further the fact that American agriculture is steeped in science, technology, and innovation, uh, quite frankly, which is my definition of American agriculture. Uh, today's hearing is an opportunity to review programs authorized in research title of the Farm Bill to ensure our universities are equipped to solve the challenges facing agriculture now and well into the future. Uh, I'm proud to represent University Park and uh, my home county is Center County. Uh, uh, actually, uh, uh, University Park was originally farmland owned by uh, uh, Moses Thompson. Uh, who donated for the construction of a farmer's high school. I wish I could came, claim a relationship, but, but it just doesn't work out when I look at the family tree. Uh, uh, but it is home of Pennsylvania's only land-grant university today, and I had the recent opportunity to spend some time uh, with a number of our, our, our great uh, Ag Staff Committee members, uh, with faculty and staff from Penn State, 
on, on this and, and many other issues, and, and I'm continuously impressed with the work that they're doing. Now, today's panel represents all types of land grants, non-land grant colleges of agriculture, and Hispanic-serving agriculture colleges and universities. And I really do appreciate the witnesses who have taken the time, that really the sacrifice to, to be able to travel here, to be a, be a part of this panel and joining us here today. And I look forward to hearing about the great work that they are doing. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And now uh, uh, I want to remind other members that they can submit their opening statements for the record uh, so that the witnesses may begin their testimony and to ensure that there's ample time for questions. So our first witness today is Dr. Bernard Eagle. He's a Senior Associate Dean and Director of Agricultural Sciences at Purdue University. And my information suggests, Dr. Engel, that you have a tremendous experience in agricultural, rural, urban, and mixed land use watersheds, and a range of constituents including nutrients, pesticides, and soil erosion. In fact, uh, you're in the top, you're rated in the top 1% of your field globally. So I congratulate you and I congratulate you as I did earlier for your, your progress in uh, Purdue University. And so with that, uh, our second witness is uh, to be introduced by Ranking Member Spenberger. And so I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm proud to welcome our next witness, Dr. Alan Grant, Dean of the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences at Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University. He directs Virginia Tech's great work in research on agriculture, human and animal health and nutrition, and so much more. I'm glad to have a great representative of our Commonwealth join us here today. Thank you for being here. Thank you, uh, Ms. Benberger. And our next witness is Dr. Moses Cairo, the Dean of the School of Agricultural and Natural Sciences at the University of Maryland, Eastern Shore. Our fourth witness uh, today is Ms. Carrie Billy, the Chief Executive Officer and President of the American Indian Higher Education Consortium. So welcome, we appreciate you being here. Our fifth witness is Dr. Clint Crable, the Dean of the Davis College of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Texas Tech University. We had a great conversation yesterday, so it's good to see you again, sir. Our sixth witness and final witness today is Dr. Catherine Urich, the Dean of the College of Natural and Agricultural Sciences at the University of California, Riverside. So I wanna thank all of you uh, and for all of your background and research and so on for being with us here today. And now we'll proceed uh, with your testimony and each of you will receive five minutes and there's a timer somewhere in front of you uh, that you can keep track of the time and it'll count down to zero, at which point uh, your time will have expired. So with that, Dr. Engel, we're gonna start with you, so please begin whenever you're ready. Good morning, Chairman Baird, Ranking Member Spanberger, and members of the subcommittee. I'm pleased to be here to offer testimony on behalf of the College of Agriculture at Purdue University. Thank you for hosting this hearing to learn more about how universities utilize the research and extension programs at the foundation of the Farm Bill. Continued support for core programs that fortify our nation's research, extension, and education system serving U.S. food, agriculture, and forestry systems as needed. Public colleges, including Purdue University, foster excellence in research innovation while educating future leaders. We support the policy recommendations put forth by the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities regarding the upcoming Farm Bill. USDA's NIFA is a critical partner of land grant institutions and provides important support through programs within Title VII. While APLU's recommendations are many, I will highlight three areas, capacity funds, competitive funds, and infrastructure. These directly impact Purdue University. Capacity funds allow our institutions to have the right people and capabilities in place to quickly respond to local issues while sustaining long-term research programs. For Purdue, the majority of these funds 
come from the Hatch, Smith Lever, and McIntyre Stennis Acts. Purdue uses capacity funding, including Hatch and Smith Lever, to support an extension plant pathology scientist and Purdue Plant and Pest Diagnostic Lab. Both are critical in identifying and managing new plant diseases and pests in Indiana, such as corn tar spot in recent years. The Hatch Multi-State Research Fund is a critical tool for 1862 land-grant institutions to conduct research important to more than one state. This program encourages collaborations across institutions and leverages funding to create greater impact. The Smith-Lever Act provides capacity funding to deliver extension programming to rural and urban communities, including nutrition education, community planning, youth education, and farm safety programs, among others. The McIntyre Stennis Act provides capacity funds to increase forestry and research and extension. These resources have allowed Purdue to hire scientists to provide practical resources to forest landowners while advancing digital technologies to manage forest resources, making Purdue a leader in digital forestry. I want to thank the committee for its committed support of NIFA's Agriculture and Food Research Initiative, or AFRI. A Purdue strength is an emphasis on collaborations across disciplines and within other institutions, as well as with industry. This has allowed our researchers to be competitive and successful in receiving funding from AFRI programs. An example of this success is the AFRI Sustainable Ag Systems Program. Purdue faculty currently lead three SAS grants totaling $10 million each to address building diverse ag systems, increasing seafood production through aquaponics, and improving forestry health through digital technologies. Our researchers are also at the forefront of using biotechnology to make important advances in both plant and animal agriculture. Jin Shin Ma, for example, is a leader in soybean genomics. He's modifying soybeans using leading edge techniques to substantially increase soybean pod numbers, which could ultimately lead to significant increases in yields for farmers. Investment in agricultural research infrastructure is needed as we look to our universities to address additional national challenges. China, India, Brazil have all made increasing investments in this area and are quickly gaining on and in some cases surpassing the U.S. in terms of capabilities. To remain competitive, we need to strengthen our commitment to invest in new facilities. Reauthorizing the Research Facilities Act and increased funding would be a first step in meeting some of these infrastructure needs. We believe inclusion of some level of cost share requirement would increase the likelihood that universities and states are committed to support and maintain that infrastructure. The recent global health crisis exposed significant risk to our country's health, food, and ag resiliency. Land-grant institutions play a critical role as, as conveners of partners, including federal agencies and private industry, to address this issue. Purdue's working with Sandia National Laboratories on an effort funded by the Department of Homeland Security to create a health, food, and ag resiliency university consortium to bring groups together to tackle this challenge. In conclusion, robust federal investment in agricultural research and extension is necessary to ensure U.S. farmers remain competitive globally while strengthening our food and ag supply chain and ensuring the resiliency of our ag and food systems. Thank you for the opportunity to provide remarks today. I'll be happy to answer questions. Thank you, Dr. Engelman. You know, uh, you mentioned soybean genomics. Uh, that, that phenomobile, that's what I've named it anyway, that, that you have that has cameras on a spray rig that can take pictures of those soybeans and, and relate to the phenotype and genotype, and I think that's very interesting. Uh, Dr. Grant, uh, you can begin whenever you're ready. Good morning, Chairman Baird, Ranking Member Spanberger, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to highlight the impacts of USDA's capacity and competitive funding in hopes that it will uh, inform your subcommittee's work on the Farm Bill. I'm going to start with uh, chatting a bit about our capacity funds. As an 1862 land-grant university, Virginia Tech receives capacity front funds from USDA through the Hatch Act, the McIntyre Stennis Program, Animal Health and Disease Program, and the Smith Lever Act. These are programs that enable us to deliver programs throughout Virginia and beyond. They allow us to tailor our research and extension efforts toward regional and local agricultural needs, 
that provides the boots on the ground during unexpected events or in times of crises, and it ensures that our business, uh, businesses have the information that they need to serve their communities. Give you an example, at our Agricultural Research and Extension Center in Winchester, Virginia, which specializes in our commercial fruit industry and wine grape research, it's conducting time-sensitive, relevant research on the spotted lanternfly, and this is an invasive species that poses significant threats to viticulture and the commercial fruit production industry. It's estimated that the spotted lanternfly uh, leads to $40 billion in crop losses per year, causing great concern for producers uh, down the east uh, coast, but uh, as far west as Illinois. And we're looking at a variety of ways to combat that invasive species, but one way uh, recently is the use of training dogs to detect spotted lanternfly eggs. And these dogs uh, work with producers and they can identify infected plants. And this allows the producer to address the invasion before the eggs are able to hatch and destroy the crops. And uh, it also is a way of minimizing uh, the use of insecticides. In addition to capacity funding, faculty compete for grant funding from the Agriculture and Food Research Initiative to carry out both applied research, which is research that can be applied quickly uh, to the industry, translated to the industry, as well as more long-term basic discovery re research, which is important in solving our future challenges in, in food and ag. USDA funding at universities also results in faculty being competitive for research from other federal agencies and state agencies and industry groups and, and foundations. I'll give you an example, the faculty in the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences alone are awarded $17 million on average annually from USDA competitive funds. That helps them leverage an additional $40 million plus 40, 40 plus million dollars from other competitive sources to advance the food and ag industry. Data from USDA ERS shows that a dollar in public investment has returned $20 to American economy for food and ag research. However, the same data also shows that spending on public ag research peaked in 2002, but it's declined since 2002 to where in 2019 levels were equivalent to those in 1970. So that just shows you the decreasing purchasing power that inflation has on this flat funding. These are alarming trends. They threaten the stability of the very system the US relies on to cultivate the agricultural workforce, to reinforce domestic preparedness against pests and diseases, and ensure the US leadership in global food security and technology. From a facilities perspective, deferred maintenance of our agricultural research facilities from the limited growth of the Research Facilities Act is limiting the quality and scope of research possible. Uh, another example at our Winchester uh, station, we have faculty expertise to research new control agents for plant diseases, but the regulatory standards for containment have outpaced our ability to conduct such research in our very aging facilities. And this has a potential to limit our ability to find solutions for some of these plant diseases. USDA capacity and competitive funding will continue to be increasingly important at our universities. And as we've highlighted in our 2022 Global Agricultural Productivity Report, which is led out of our college, increased public investment in ag research and development is essential to accelerate the productivity growth that's required for the world's agricultural systems, to be sustainable, to be resilient to shocks, and USDA funding is essential in meeting this mission. So again, thank you for your support of agricultural research, extension, and education, and thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you, Dr. Grant. And you know, I really appreciate you uh, uh, recognizing the importance, the importance of animal agriculture in agriculture. And then I always learn something from these sessions, particularly from people like you. I didn't realize we were training dogs to detect uh, insect pests and so on and so on. Very interesting. Thank you. So, uh, Dr. Cairo, you may begin whenever you're ready. Uh, thank you, Chair Baird, uh, Ranking Member Spanberger, and members of the committee. 
On behalf of Dr. Paul Jones, President of Fort Valley State University and Chair of the 1890 Council of Presidents, Dr. Heidi Anderson, President of the University of Maryland Eastern Shore, my fellow 1890 Agriculture Deans and the entire 1890 Land Grant community, I thank you for this opportunity to speak about programs under Title VII of the Farm Bill, which are critically important for us. For 137 years, UMES has distinguished itself by delivering high, highly impactful programs. Today, UMES is a Kanagi II doctoral research university offering innovative programs in agriculture, healthcare, and many STEM areas. However, today I am honored to appear on behalf of the entire 1890 community. Title VII provides critical resources to support the three core mission components of research, extension, and teaching at the 1918-1990 universities. The resources provide the foundational capacity that facilitates program implementation and the ability to leverage additional resources from other public and private sector entities. Before I discuss why Title VII is so important to us, Please allow me to thank Congress, uh, the Biden-Harris administration, and the previous administrations for their support and efforts on behalf of the 1890 universities. Please allow me now to mention a few specific programs. The Evans Allen Agricultural Research and the 1890 Extension programs facilitated the implementation of programs focusing on food security, natural resources, environmental health, human health, and development. Our work targets critical issues with the local, regional, national, or even global dimension. For UMES, important focal areas include commodities like poultry, safeguarding the Chesapeake watershed, and addressing issues that impinge on underserved farmers and communities. The Capacity Building Grants Program allows 1890s to attract and retain highly productive faculty such as Dr. Parveen, a food safety specialist, and Dr. Zebelo, uh, an entomologist who uh, coordinates the Northeast Regional uh, Node of the IR4 program. The scholarships for students at 1890 institutions allow us to train the next generation of food and agricultural workers. This game-changing investment will bear dividends for many years to come. The six centers of excellence established through the 2018 Farm Bill are fostering strong collaborative work among all the 19 universities. While the 1890 facilities program has allowed campuses to undertake limited uh, maintenance and develop some limited new facilities. However, project implementation takes a long time because of the limited size and process challenges. There is a dire need uh, for infrastructure to support existing and new programs, such as the veterinary science program being developed by UMES, to address the serious national worker shortage in this area. In conclusion, the 1890 universities are making indispensable contribution by producing a skilled and diverse national workforce and implementing research and extension programs that generate and apply solutions to underpin vibrant rural and urban communities and economies while addressing other critical challenges. We're very grateful to you for your past support and respectfully seek your commitment to the following 1890 priorities under the Title VII of the 2023 Farm Bill. Reauthorization of the following programs, Evans Island, 1890 Extension, 1890 Capacity Building Grants, 1890 Facilities Improvement, Scholarship for Students at 1890 Institution and Centers of Excellence. We also request that the Evans Allen allocation as a percentage share of hatch funds be increased from 30 to 40 percent, and that tuition and fees for graduate students be an allowable expense. Additionally, we request that the allocation of 1890 extension as a percentage share of Smith Lever funds be increased from 20 to 40 percent. We also request that the number of centers of excellence be increased from 6 to 10, and the allocation for each uh, be increased to 5 million per year. I'm deeply grateful for the opportunity to give this testimony and to share our perspectives. I look forward to answering questions that you may have for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Cairo, for, for your very informative uh, information. Uh, we appreciate that very much. Ms. Billy, uh, you can begin whenever you're ready. 
On behalf of the nation's 35 tribal college land-grant institutions, or 1994s, thank you, Chairman Baird and Ranking Member Spamberger, for this opportunity to testify. Tribal colleges are accredited, place-based institutions chartered by American Indian tribes or the federal government. Most are located in rural Indian reservations from the northernmost point of Alaska to Lake Superior and down to Arizona's southwestern border. The 35 1994s serve about 80% of what is left of Indian country in the U.S. Tribal communities face many challenges, but our lands are rich and our people are resilient. The 1994s embody the intent of the first Morrell Act, defined by place. They provide relevant, affordable education to all with community-based services like family gardening, traditional bison hunts, and drone certification. They're working together to strengthen tribal economies, revitalize languages, and sustainably use our lands, waters, and traditional foods. About 75% of our land, the remaining tribal land in the U.S., is forested or agriculture land, and our songs, stories, and languages come from the land, water, mountains, and air. This means the four small 1994 programs administered by NIFA are important. As the NIFA website states, the 1994 institutions often serve as the primary institutions of scientific inquiry, knowledge, and learning for our tribal communities. Several of them also serve areas larger than five states. At Bay Mills Community College in Michigan, Steve Yanni integrated all of their land grant programs into sustainable agriculture and food production consistent with Anishinaabek values on their 280 acre Washkie Bay farm. At Navajo Technical University in New Mexico, Chelsea Whitewater is doing research to identify the scientific properties of Navajo tea so its medicinal qualities can be proven to Western science. At Salish Kootenai College in Pablo, Montana, Adrian Layton is using the college's new status as a four-year forestry degree-granting institution under the McIntyre Stennis Act to conduct tribally-led research on invasive threats to white bark pine, a high-altitude keystone species. If the white, park, white, park, white bark pine dies out, the whole ecosystem could collapse because this super nutritious, high protein tree does everything from protecting the region from snowmelt avalanches to feeding grizzlies when they need it most. Sitting Bull College in North and South Dakota hosts community markets and coordinates research and extension in vegetable production systems, irrigation systems, and ranching. They also provide financial literacy and agribusiness programs. These programs might not sound too important, but they are. In Arizona, for example, native farmers make up 50% of all the farmers in the state, and they are aging. So as you work to reauthorize the Farm Bill, we have four quick recommendations. Work for parity in the land-grant programming. In, in FY 2023, the 50 1862 land grants to receive 265 million for research programs. The 1980, the 1890s, 89 million. The 35 1994 institution received five million dollars. For extension, 325 million for the 1862s, 72 million for the 1890s, and 11 million for the 1994s. None of this is enough but please address these inequities. The 1994s need about $500,000 per program per institution, or 17.5 million for each NIFA program. This subcommittee through the Farm Bill can permanently authorize and support supplemental funding for basic 1994 activities. You can also remove the outdated funding cap on our equity payments. There's a 100% matching requirement for the new beginnings for tribal students that keeps 1994s from participating in this program. The program provides scholarships for native students, precisely the students tribal colleges serve. The matching requirement should be eliminated for 1994s. The 1994s also are the only institutions required to partner with other institutions for our own research. Please remove this requirement. We likely will partner but it should be our choice. Almost all agriculture facilities are in abysmal shape. The 1994 facilities are worse. They don't exist. 
We need a facilities programs for 1994s and a broadband access and sustainability program in rural development. We have more amendments in our written testimony. Please carefully review them and adopt them all. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Billy. And I, you know, I learned uh, here the, net, the health benefits of the Navajo cheese. I think that's uh, interesting. And then the, the importance of white bark pine. So thank you for your input. So Dr. Grable, uh, you can begin whenever you wish. Thank you, Chairman Baird, Ranking Member Spanberger, and members of the Subcommittee on Conservation Research and Biotechnology for convening this hearing to address a critical importance and needs for agricultural research, education, and infrastructure. It is an honor to address this committee on the important issue of agricultural research and its connection to productive and competitive U.S. agriculture and vibrant, successful rural communities. Texas Tech is a comprehensive non-land-grant university with an enrollment of more than 40,000 students across the university, including the medical school, veterinary school, law school, and graduate school. In addition, the Texas Tech system includes the non-land-grant Angelo State University with significant investments in agriculture, as well as Midwestern State University with an agricultural program. The Davis College at Texas Tech University has an enrollment of approximately 3,400 students across all of our disciplines in agriculture and generated approximately 48 million in annual research expenditures including approximately 25 million in federal research awards, primarily from USDA, over the 21-22 period. Congressional support for our research programs has real direct impact. For example, USDA NIFA funding helps support our genomics research on crop stress tolerance that is leading to seed technology that improves drought tolerance in cotton, sorghum, and soybeans which is critical for the future of agricultural production. Our vital research relationship with the USDA Agricultural Research Service's Ogallala Aquifer Program has led to important improvements in water conservation strategies and increased productivity and profitability in water-limited regions of the Great Plains. Finally, your support for policy research through USDA Office of the Chief Economics results in high quality policy and market analysis that is annually briefed to and used by this very committee. As you know, agriculture is a critical component of the U.S. economy. According to USDA's Economic Research Service, agriculture contributed 1.3 trillion, or 5.4 percent of U.S. gross domestic product in 21. In addition, agriculture accounted for 10.5 percent of U.S. employment and food alone accounted for 12.4% of U.S. household expenditures in 2021. But despite the overall economic impact and the widespread availability of food, food insecurity in the U.S. remains a critical problem and global food security is, insecurity excuse me, is often listed as a critical issue for U.S. national security. To ensure a secure, safe, and sustainable food and fiber supply, I believe the U.S. needs a concerted effort and investment in the research and outreach necessary to enhance U.S. agricultural productivity and competitiveness, and that we must be cognizant of the influences that different funding sources may have on our ability to consistency, consistently deliver high-quality research that serves U.S. agriculture. Not only will this investment enhance the competitiveness of U.S. agricultural export that generate over $200 billion in revenue annually, but also provide pathways that improve food and fiber affordability, quality, and access to U.S. citizens supporting well-being and positive economic outcomes for both producers and our consumers. A 2021 report by Gordian estimated that the cost to upgrade and address deferred maintenance at U.S. colleges of agriculture to be about $11.5 billion, with $38 billion to replace dilapidated facilities. At Texas Tech alone, our deferred maintenance is approximately $6.3 million. 
The state of Texas and private donors have made significant investments in our research infrastructure, but that investment simply cannot repair or replace all the requirements to meet the research challenges and problems facing U.S. agriculture. In fiscal year 2023, Congress made a modest investment in modernization through Research Facilities Act competitive funding program. We very much appreciate that support. To better address the long-term needs for modernization to remain competitive internationally, we ask that Congress support a $5 billion mandatory funding program through the Research Facilities Act through Title VII of the Farm Bill. Thank you again for this opportunity to share our experiences and perspectives on this critical component of the Farm Bill process. The non-land-grant agricultural programs across the U.S serve as a critical engine for the future growth and educating our next generation of leaders, as well as providing important research and outreach programs. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Grable, and, and thanks for mentioning the importance of research as it relates to, you know, food security. And that was, you had that through your program, so appreciate that. Uh, Dr. Yurik, uh, you can begin whenever you wish. Good morning, Chairman Thompson, Chairman Baird, Ranking Member Spanberger, and other members of the committee. My name is Catherine Yurick, and I serve as, a, as the Dean of the Natural and Agricultural Sciences at the University of California in Riverside. I'm honored to have this opportunity to discuss the agricultural research that is currently being, doc, be, being conducted at UC Riverside and to provide perspectives on Title VII as you consider provisions for the next Farm Bill. It is also an honor to be here today to testify from the perspective of Hispanic Serving Institute, or HSI. As part of the 10-campus University of California system, UCR is proud to be part of the land-grant partnership, as am I, as a three-time uh, graduate of land-grant institutions. UC Riverside is also designated by the USDA as a Hispanic Serving Agricultural College and University, or HASAKU for short. On June 1st, 2023, UC Riverside was pleased to have been invited to join the Association of American Universities, or AAU, which includes the nation's top research institutions. I'm also pleased to be a witness representing from a viewpoint from California, which continues to be the nation's top agricultural state. I wanted to start by sharing several HSI and Hisaku priorities for the Farm Bill authorization process. At UC Riverside, the agricultural research we conduct as an HSI is unparalleled and financially supported by many of the agricultural programs authorized in Title VII. Specific to HSIs in Hasaku, these include reauthorizing and supporting robust funding for the Education Grants Program for Hispanic Serving Institutions, which fall under the NIFA. This program is critical to providing education and STEM opportunities at HSIs. UC Riverside supports the reauthorization of the education grants program for HSIs, increasing the current authorization of funding from $40 million to $100 million each year. Another priority for HSIs is to build capacity for the Hasaku program. Unfortunately, the programs have not been funded, and this has resulted in a lack of opportunities for Hasakus to expand educational and workforce programs. UC Riverside recommends the reauthorization and expansion of Hasaku-supported grant opportunities. I'd also like to take the opportunity to highlight some examples of critical research that's taking place at UC Riverside. We are at the forefront of conducting cutting edge research to find treatments and cures for citrus greening disease, also known as Hong Long Bing or HLB. It's one of the most destructive diseases of citrus worldwide. It's already devastated the citrus industry in Florida and threatening the citrus industry in California. One of the most exciting discoveries in the fight against citrus greening disease was made possible in part through funding from AFRI and CDRE, the Citrus Disease Research and Extension Program. Professor Hailing Jin identified a naturally occurring peptide found in citrus greening disease tolerant relatives, and it found that this bacteria, this peptide, can kill the bacteria that causes the disease and has the potential to eradicate the disease. So that's our, one of our first success stories. Thank you for that funding. I'd also like to briefly mention avocado research at UC Riverside. We play a major role in helping California to be the agricultural powerhouse of the nation in growing avocados, and the campus has over 70 years experience in breeding avocados. So grants from the USDA, such as NIFA's 
SCRI program, which is a specialty crop research initiative program, support our avocado breeding program. So thanks to SCRI, which uh, allows us to support the over 400 plus agricultural crops that we have in the state of California, and ensure that we have an abundant supply of avocados for the next Super Bowl. <laughs> now I'd like to address honeybee research at UC Riverside. With the help of USDA funding and Title VII, UCR conducts research aimed at understanding honeybee colony collapse. UCR is home to the world-renowned Center for Integrative Bee Research, or CYBER, that serves as a beekeeping think tank. Working, so several folks are working together to understand bee health and to address bee colony collapse. Additional resources are needed in the Farm Bill for this program too. Additional pri priorities also include continued support for the Hatch and Smith Lever, Lever Act into cooperative extension, as we heard from our colleagues. This funding is critical to supporting agricultural research, everything that we do at UC Riverside. Research, education, and outreach at UC Riverside and throughout the entire University of California system. One example, another success story I'd like to share, is the work of Professor Georges Vitalakis. He is the director of the Citrus Clonal Protection Program, or CCPP, which is part of the National Clean Plant Network. He is also an extension specialist. His job is to review all the citrus that comes into the state of California, make sure that it's clean and can be propagated in, in not only California, but the rest of the country. His work is at the forefront of cooperative extension and is vital to understanding and developing science to address citrus greening disease, for example. Uh, I'd also like to lend my support to the Specific Facilities Act, again, as, as documented by my colleagues, and I'd also urge the committee to consider reauthorizing expanding the Ag Arta pilot program. And so with that, thank you again for the opportunity to testify about the importance of support of Title VII, and thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Orr. And you covered a wide range, citrus diseases, honeybees, and avocados. I mean, you covered it all, didn't you? <laughs> anyway, I thank all of you for, for your testimony. And so at, at this time, uh, what we do is allow the members uh, to ask questions. And we do that in order of seniority, as well as alternating between the majority and the minority members. And in order to, um, to, to also establish that order, is based on the arrival of the members that came to the meeting. So you will be recognized for five minutes uh, in, uh, in that order. And um, we want to get in as many questions as we can when we have this kind of talented expertise here today. So uh, with that, uh, Chairman Thompson, do you have any questions you want to start with? Well, Chairman, thank you. Yes, I do. And first of all, thank you to all the witnesses. Uh, outstanding, uh, both uh, written and oral testimony, and uh, just very appreciative of that. And why I frequently hear about the need for federal funds to address the deferred maintenance backlog, backlog on agricultural research facilities, this is an issue that goes back decades. In fact, the National Agricultural Research Extension and Teaching Policy Act of 1977, the year I graduated from high school, uh, required USDA to conduct a study on the status and the future of needs of agricultural research facilities. Without objection, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to insert into the, insert the two reports that resulted from this uh, 1977 required study into the record. Without objection. Today, the deferred maintenance backlog, as if we heard from a uh, number of our witnesses, estimated to be over $11.5 billion. And while I understand the need to clear this deferred maintenance backlog, backlog I'm also interested in a long-term solution to ensure the backlog never reaches this level again. Mm -hmm. So aside from funding for a competitive grant program focused on facilities, are there mechanisms that can be put in place to ensure research funding is going to facility upkeep. And I'm, that's, I'm gonna open that up to anyone that would like to respond to it on our panel today. Thank you, Chairman Thompson, uh, Clint Crable, Texas Tech. You know, I, I think uh, we can think a lot more about uh, flex space and, and forward thinking knowing what we've learned from the last 40 plus years with regard to now what is deferred maintenance. Uh, I think the real opportunity is to uh, predict what the new technologies might be coming forth and make sure in any new facilities that we're building, it's more of a plug and play space 
uh, where we can adapt it over time uh, and keep up with the maintenance uh, instead of letting things uh, become dilapidated and then happen to invest large sums of money to, to correct those. Very good. Thank you. Uh, do you want to reflect briefly on, because uh, I also think what you're doing with your veterinarian school kind of speaks to that as well in terms of the public-private partnership, uh, in terms of clinical space? Yeah, ec ec excellent point. So we're just getting ready to start our third class at Texas Tech Veterinary School. Uh, and instead of building a clinic, uh, this was before my time, but the committee had the foresight to really think about uh, how do we engage with our our public and private in a public private partnership with the private partners who are really in need of the expertise that the veterinary school will be developing. So there was no clinic built at uh, the new veterinary school at Texas Tech and instead we'll be using those private partners to place students in their third and fourth year to get the real world hands on experience and hopefully uh, be embedded into those rural communities and ultimately uh, purchase those veterinary clinics over time. Very good. Nice application of innovation. Uh, any other thoughts from any of our panelists? Please go ahead. Yes, thank you, uh, Bernie Engel from Purdue. Um, you know, we've not been standing still with research facilities. So our institution, for example, have invested about $250 million in the last 10 years in agricultural research facilities. It's always a partnership, a partnership between the state, the university, and donors. Uh, the other innovative thing that I think we've begun to put in place is a quasi-endowment that's part of the now required resources to, before we build a building. Those are put in place to generate resources for maintenance. I guess I would though pivot from this and say, to me, the really big issue is about the future of research and the facilities we need to do the future work, the work that even we're doing now in many cases. To me, that's a much bigger challenge and need than talking about deferred maintenance. Very good. Any other thoughts? Please go ahead. I just want to bring up one example. Uh, when I talk about citrus screening disease, one of the innovations that come from this, again, was supported by USDA funding, is doing genomic sequencing. Doing this type of research requires a much more sophisticated type of research infrastructure than we think of historically. So I'm looking at UC Riverside. Many of our greenhouses will built, were built in the 40s and 50s. They're still wonderful at doing that type of research, but 21st century research is not done in these facilities. And so updating and upgrading and making sure that we have this space to do innovation and bring these technologies to the forefront using the same tools as the pharmaceutical industry does is really important for us. Very good. Thank you. And Mr. Chairman, my time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I'm going to yield myself five minutes now to ask questions, if you'll allow me. And the first one, uh, the first one deals with, um, with the written testimony of Dr. Engel. And it, it serves as a testament to profound impact of the capacity funds in transformative research at Purdue University. So. How do capacity funds, such as those provided through the Hatch, the Smith Lever, and the McIntyre Stenisax, enable institutions to respond quickly to local and regional issues while sustaining long-term research program? Dr. Ingle? Thank you. Let me maybe expand on the example that I gave very briefly in the oral testimony earlier. Uh, so 2018, corn tar spot shows up. Had never seen it in the U.S. before, had never seen it certainly in the state of Indiana. Because we have investments in people via the, the uh, capacity funds you speak to, we had Darcy Talenko ready to act. She was the first to discover it. She then organized colleagues in surrounding states, and they continue now to monitor, uh, to cooperate, and do work across the states uh, I believe she has some 100 plots this year that are important then to monitor around the state looking for corn tar spot, but also other diseases in corn and soybeans. So that base support via capacity funds provides that, and then on top of that, she and her colleagues compete for other competitive resources through AFRI, for example, that allow them to do much broader work that has tremendous impact. Thank you. 
And my next question goes to all the witnesses. Um, you know, the length of each farm bill is five years, so it's important that the research title remains forward-looking uh, to ensure that American agriculture can meet the future challenges. So my question is, are the research programs, both capacity and competitive, currently flexible enough to solve problems the industry will face well beyond the, the life of the next farm bill? So Dr. Engel, you're on the, you're on the first order there. Thank you. We, we certainly uh, are able to, to work within the, the five-year time frame, but always additional time to understand and, and make sure that we're, we're uh, focusing research for the long term. You know, realize that across the institutions represented, we do work that, that's ready in, in short order, but we're also looking out 15, 20 years and beyond. And it's that work that's well into the future that sometimes is a bit of a challenge as we have five-year horizons. So any of the other witnesses? Dr. Grant, you look like you're ready to say something. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would just add to that, uh, yeah, I think the five-year uh, window does provide us uh, flexibility to do, uh, to address both long-term and short-term. Um, our, our researchers um, do a combination of basic discovery uh, innovative research that uh, sometimes the results of that aren't applied for 15, 20, 25 years. But we also have researchers that are doing uh, much more uh, short-term research to address uh, uh, current issues and problems in the industry. And, and a lot of those are researchers that are working very closely with our extension specialists and our agents to get that information quickly to, to, to the clientele. So. Um, again, I think it's a combination of both uh, long-term and short-term uh, adequately uh, uh, provided through the capacity and competitive funds. Thank you. Dr. Cairo? Uh, I, I concur with my colleagues. And uh, just to highlight an example, so we've been working on the Chesapeake watershed for more than 20 years. Many challenges, and, but it's been, the programs have been allowing us to address the challenges as we go forth. But at the same time, we are able to incorporate new areas, particularly digital agriculture, smart agriculture, and are looking at that with a long term in mind as well. So yes, thank you. Miss Billy, we're, we're getting down to about 30 seconds, so. Quickly, I would just say, if there was more research funding, it would definitely be a lot easier to get the work done in five years. Um, so I think that's one solution, but um, NSF has some grants that are 10 years, which gives a little longer time to, to complete, especially more complex research. Dr. Grable. Five years allows us the opportunity to respond to the action items of today None of us are doing our job very well if we're only looking within the next five years. So I, I think uh, creating a vision and, and understanding what the potential grand challenges are in the future are certainly important to us. But the five-year time frame gives us a means to respond uh, with the current issues of today. So Dr. Gierick, I'm over my time, but uh, anyway, since I chair in this committee, we're gonna let you, uh, <laughs> University, University of California, Riverside, go ahead. Thank you. I will chime in. It has to do with the crops, from my opinion. So there's some crops that you can do. You can do some analysis and research and innovation over a period of a couple of years. But when you're thinking about trees, avocados, we're looking at decades, citrus trees, decades, pecans, almonds, nuts, fruits, all of those types of research take decades, decades and decades of research. And that we need to plan for the long term. So we need both. We need the short term and the longer term. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Spanberger, uh, you have five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Dr. Grant, I'd like to begin with you. I have heard from livestock producers across Virginia's 7th District um, ab about the challenges they face uh, because of limitations um, in uh, the livestock processing industry due to some workforce shortages. Um, and that workforce shortages, particularly on the processing side, are one barrier for the industry's, industry's growth. Um, I know that your team at Virginia Tech is working on workforce development issues. Could you potentially uh, speak about how Virginia Tech is working with the Virginia agriculture industry to identify workforce needs, provide educational programming to meet these needs, and connect students with employers? 
Yes, thank you, um, uh, ma'am, for uh, raising that important question. Um, we know that the agricultural workforce needs are, are outpacing the number of graduates with degrees in, in food and ag and natural resources and related areas. And uh, our, our universities and colleges are working hard to fill that, uh, bridge that gap. We are offering educational programs at all levels uh, to help students prepare for the, the many entry points into uh, careers in agriculture uh, through extension. We offer robust 4-H programs, for example, which in Virginia expose uh, nearly 200,000 youth to um, a variety of, of areas, including agriculture, and it's an opportunity for us to generate some real interest in the agriculture and food industry. And then we also offer extension programs for adult learners, um, which are taught by our extension agents and, and specialists, and we partner with a lot of volunteers to help carry out those programs as well. A good example of, uh, of an adult learning program would be our, our beginning farmer and rancher uh, coalition program. This is a statewide uh, extension program uh, funded largely by USDA and it allows us to assist uh, beginning farmers, new farmers, uh, startup farmers, and, and in, includes uh, resources and information to a system like farm planning and, and land acquisition information, business management, marketing. Um, it helps them, for example, with finding markets for, for their meat products. Um, and uh, also uh, a system with sustainable uh, practices. And, and Dr. Grant, the, certainly Virginia Tech is well known within the Commonwealth for its agricultural programs, but even for the students who might be uh, attending the university, how, what are you doing to kind of connect young people with the possibilities that exist in agriculture at this moment, but then as technology change and research innovates, kind of see that they can have a long-term future, you know, both as producers if they choose to be the farmers themselves, but certainly in the larger ecosystem? Yeah, very good question. And uh, in our, our college programs, a variety of degree programs, both at the undergraduate, graduate level, and even in the professional uh, uh, schools like the veterinary uh, careers, um, what we do is we make sure that we include a lot of ex what we call experiential learning in our degree programs. These are experiences, hands-on experiences. Um, oftentimes our students are engaged in research, and this is research, uh, discovery research in a basic research lab on campus, or we get these students really excited about careers in agriculture if we take them to our Agricultural Research and Extension Center where we're doing some applied research that has immediate impact on the, uh, on the industry. And a lot of those projects are done in collaboration with local farmers. So these students are, are seeing the impact that their work is having on the industry. That really excites them. And with my remaining time, I just want to talk about kind of the connection between what's happening at your universities and what we heard here in the committee just last month. We heard from NRCS Chief Cosby um, that one of the barriers to NRCS hiring is that too many applicants apply to the agency without required coursework in soils. Uh, and so I would love any comments that any of the panelists might have about how some of the hiring requirements and coursework requirements from your perspectives um, are either very necessary and worth keeping or in the grand scheme might create barriers. Uh, and we'll follow up in writing as well for those that might have uh, more extensive comments. But if anyone wants to take that on. I can respond to that, that question just as an example of what the tribal colleges do because we're in rural America um, and one of the major hires, hi hiring sources is USDA. The tribal colleges work with the NCRS and other agencies on the KSAs to make sure that our courses provide the, the skills that they need so, they're, so our graduates are trained when they're ready. So we work on the front end. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Ranking Member. And now we go to a neighbor of, Il of Indiana, Representative Miller from Illinois. Thank you, and thank you to all the witnesses for coming. You're really rousing us up about uh, the importance and the impact of our research. And so I want to give, some of you have shared, give you an opportunity to share 
um, what you think is the most exciting research or the perhaps the lesser known research that's going on at each of your institutions. And then also to channel um, the spirit of our great hero, Dr. George Washington Carver. I'm interested to know if any of you are doing research on soil health. Okay, shoot. we'll start with Mr. Engel. Sorry, thank you. Yes, we're doing research on soil health, but the, what I want to talk about is digital forestry. Uh, mm -hmm. I would maintain we are among leaders uh, globally in digital forestry. Uh, we have a goal of being able to measure every single tree and characterize it on the planet. Uh, how are we going to do that? We're going to do that with technology, UAVs, cameras, uh, backpack devices, under canopy, um, iPhones, cell phones, other technology that's being deployed, and we're well on our way. That sounds exciting. And so are we getting greener or not? I think the opportunity here is to really characterize and now use many of the resources that in your part of the world, my part of the world, are these small forested areas that are undertreated, unmanaged, but are a tremendous green resource. So a huge opportunity. Thank you. Mr. Grant. Thank you for the question. Yes, we uh, at Virginia Tech are also uh, involved in a lot of soil health uh, research and extension, so both basic and applied research that's being applied to, to the field. Um, one of the exciting things that is happening in our College of Agriculture and Life Sciences is a new center for advanced innovation um, in, in agriculture. And uh, this, this includes a number of platforms, things like cyber biosecurity, which is becoming more and more important as, as the industry becomes more digital. And we're handling these large databases that are being shared back and forth with a, a variety of, of individuals and groups. It also includes platforms in precision agriculture and also an area of controlled environment agriculture. This is an area that uh, we think at Virginia is well suited uh, to, to grow in. Um, because we're so close to uh, such a large population of the country um, producing that locally produced uh, food in very controlled conditions where we can control diseases and, and so forth. Um, a lot of this uh, new center is involving uh, new ways of doing business, uh, lots of industry partnerships, um, and uh, really engaging the industry uh, and our students uh, in some of this uh, real exciting uh, research and extension work. Thank you. Thank you, very interesting. Mr. Cairo, Dr. Cairo. Uh, thank you. So uh, I'll start with soil health. Uh, and being uh, from the Delmar Peninsula, one of the uh, our big concerns is uh, so salt water intrusion. So we, do, we are doing work tr to try and understand the microbiome around the rhizosphere and to be able to see how we can respond to uh, salt water intrusion into agricultural soils. In this context, looking at it from a, from a forestry perspective. Uh, but I think the other exciting area is just looking at how we can deploy smart agriculture in uh, or, uh, technology, digital approaches to address some of the existing issues like um, uh, nutrient, uh, nutrient management by using smart technology to apply fertilizers and to apply water in a more effective way. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, why don't we continue on? I wasn't sure if you had time, but the tribal colleges are doing soil health research because we're particularly in the southwest where there's been a lot of overgrazing, so a lot of work in that area. But one of the most exciting is Juneberry research that's going on in the, in the Great Plains. Juneberries and bison supported the Plains Indians for generations until uh, they were almost annihilated. But that Juneberries are super high protein, high antioxidant. If we could figure out a way to grow them at scale and make them taste really good, it could help solve some of that food insecurity problems and the food shortages worldwide. Huh, that's, a, that's interesting. I've never heard of them. OK, uh, Dr. Crable. Yeah, so light, life begins in the soil. And we're doing a lot of systems work, uh, looking at how animal and plants uh, come together to improve soil health. Uh, in, we're in a, a semi-arid environment in Lubbock, Texas, and so we're talking about uh, water in terms of years remaining 
uh, as we uh, live on the southern end, edge of the Oglala Aquifer. So we've left it up at Davis College Water Center where we're really studying uh, the importance of water conservation. Of course, water conservation fits in with soil health as we think of things more at a system level. Uh, we've also lifted up the Institute of Genomics for Crop Abiotic Stress Tolerance. Uh, again, with help from some USDA funding that we're appreciative of, we were able to attract the National Academies of Science scientists, uh, and they are working on genomics for cotton and grain sorghum to decrease the water footprint uh, for farmers uh, that plant those row crops. Thank you. And then Dr. Urich. Thank you. I, um, soil health, yes. If with, you need clean air, clean soil, clean water in order to grow most of our crops. So yes, with my colleagues, we're doing a lot of research in that area. But I'll do, do this very short. The cool, coolest thing that I think we're doing right now is what I'll call space tomatoes. So be ability to grow tomatoes in space. So really the idea is you want the fruit to be bigger and the, the leaves to be smaller. So if you're gonna go it out, grow it out in space, you have to figure out what the light, the right light wavelength is gonna be. We, this is work that is funded by the USDA as well as NASA. So it is also something that is drawing a lot of philanthropic interest too. But it, it is, and if we can grow it out in space, that is also gonna help our food insecurity, but it really starts with understanding how plants grow under certain conditions. Thank you. Thank you again for coming and for sharing. Uh, thank you. Lady yields back. And now we're going to stay in Illinois. Representative Bozinski. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Ranking Member. Um, it's great to hear from all of the panelists today. And I just want to say thank you for all of your really important work. I found the discussion to be really interesting. Um, you know, I'm a proud graduate of the University of Illinois in 1862 Land Grant University, which is situated in the 13th Congressional District that I now represent. I am fully supportive of the land grant mission and am actively seeking ways to support research and extension services. I'm very grateful again for all of the work that you each do every day, um, whether at a land grant university institution or not in advancing agriculture to meet the needs of the future. I want to acknowledge those of you representing 1890 and later institutions and I look forward to building a partnership. Um, to extend opportunities to minority and underserved farmers and ranchers and researchers. The University of Illinois, along with many community colleges in the district I represent, is situated in what I like to call the ag tech corridor of the country, a fast growing area of agricultural research, as I'm sure you know. There are a number of important research initiatives in Urbana-Champaign that are moving tech into the future from the energy farm to soy face, to farm doc daily. Uh, the University of Illinois is committed to serving our farmers through public and private partnerships. With that in mind, I have a few questions for our panelists about how we can better support the land grant mission through Title VII and the Farm Bill. My first question is, with fewer and fewer students entering college in the workforce from farming backgrounds, and I, I know Dr. Grant talked a little bit about um, what is happening at Virginia Tech, which was great, and I'd love to hear from some of the other panelists as well. Um, we are looking at a potential shortage of farmers and agricultural researchers. How can we partner with land-grant universities to increase engagement of students and young professionals within the agricultural industry? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, so we, we've been working very solidly on the pipeline, pipeline issues. We're reaching out beyond the 4-H mm -hmm. uh, components to also engage uh, middle and high schools. So in Maryland, for example, we partner with the World Food Prize to run a statewide competition where we bring young people, they write essays uh, about agriculture and we expose them to agriculture. Ultimately, the winners do end up going to Des Moines, Iowa for the World Food Prize uh, meeting. But also through the minorities in agriculture and natural resource and related sciences, we've been uh, starting chapters at, at high schools. So we can be able to encourage uh, and expose students at a much earlier age before they get, get to, to us. But I think also the linkage with industry uh, and being able to provide those experiential learning opportunities 
uh, is really critical, and we've been reaching out and forming partnerships with the private sector so our students can be able to get opportunities to, to go out and really know what's happening in the real world. And I think that way we can get more. That's excellent. Um, any other panelists like to add what you're, how you're working on this? I'd like to um, just uh, give one example that the National Science Foundation does, where I think they, National Science Foundation really encourages internships and more of that experiential learning. They have a program called REU, Research Experience for Undergraduates. So if you have a, a NSF grant, you can apply for a small grant that funds internships for students to bring them in. There's not that kind of program at USDA. And I, I think with our grants, I don't really get a sense of really encouraging the undergraduate student involvement. So if I think programs like the REUs, if USDA implemented those, that could help address some of the problems. I'm, I'm from a non-land grant, but mm -hmm. if it's okay, I may give that perspective. I spent a lot of time at land-grant universities, but, but believe what we're doing kind of rivals uh, that approach anyway. So I think public-public partnerships are critically important. Lubbock Independent School District is developing an agri-STEM that'll be a very comprehensive agriculture facility right next to one of our research facilities. Mm -hmm. And so it'll be a great opportunity to, uh, to connect with those high school students and get them plugged in to opportunities that exist for careers in agriculture. We also have elementary schools that are now reaching out uh, as this has taken hold. So I think, I think connecting and developing partnerships public public partnerships with K through 12 mm -hmm. is a huge opportunity for uh, for land grant and non land grant institutions in the future. One and a half percent of the population is directly involved in production agriculture. So as we all know, right, the, our clientele, our consumers are completely disconnected with agriculture. Mm -hmm. But we we put the A in STEM. Agriculture puts the A in STEM. We are a STEM field, and so I think the more opportunities that we take and make to get in front of learners earlier on their learning journey uh, will help us to celebrate the great opportunities that exist in agriculture. Yeah, and I'm unfortunately out of time, but I, I very much agree with you that you know starting earlier is really where it's at. K through 12, it's great to hear that there's a lot of outreach into younger students in order to reach them while they're starting to think about college. So that's great. Thank you so much, and I yield back. Thank you. Young lady. Yields back, and now we're going to stay in the Midwest and go to Missouri. Representative Alford. Thank you, Chairman Barrett. I appreciate that. Uh, thank you so much for everyone being here today. Uh, a stellar uh, group of panelists here today. You know, in Missouri, we're proud to have both the University of Missouri, an 1862 land grant institution, and Lincoln University, an 1890 land grant institution. In fact, the University of Missouri's Ag Experiment Station performs cutting edge research over 14,000 acres and houses the Bradford Research Farm, one of the largest concentrations of research plots for crops and soils in the great state of Missouri. To make sure the cutting edge technologies and ag innovation developed at our university supports our farmers' collaboration with industry partners and extension programs are essential. Dr. Engel, I want to start with you. you um, we've talked about how public-private partnerships uh, provide our farmers with tools to enhance yields and optimize inputs. Uh, let's talk about that a little bit further. How do we, how do we grow on that concept, sir? Yes, thank you. So I, I know at Purdue, for example, that uh, in the College of Agriculture, I looked the number up, uh, a full 20% of our research support comes from private partners. Uh, so private partners are at the table. They're an important part of what we do. Uh, another incredibly important resource we have in the state and, and in other states typically as well are checkoff organizations. Corn and soy make investments in applied research make investments in some longer-term research as well. So our, our engagement with our stakeholders is incredibly important so that they see the value, they make the investments, industry makes the investments as well. Thank you, sir. Um, recently, and we've talked a little bit about this so far, there's been a lot of focus on the ability of the United States to remain competitive with other countries, the BRIC countries, China, Brazil, uh, India, Russia. And they're rapidly increasing, especially China, their public investments uh, in ag research. Reiterate for me again, uh, Dr. Urich, 
why is it so important uh, to increase the investments in ag research on our end uh, to keep pace with some of these, uh, these countries like China, who is really a, a, a pacing threat to our national security? I'll say very simply why it's important, because we all need to eat. So we need to make sure that we are ensuring the safety of our food supply. So safe food, food production, food capacity, all aspects of food, we need to make sure that we have that in hand. And we are falling behind. And I'll just say, it's not just food, it's not just agriculture, it's many other areas that we are, that we are falling behind relative to the BRICS. But I strongly endorse, we need to make sure, again, I said to clean, we talked about soils, clean soil, clean air, clean water. We need to have a clean and healthy and abundant food supply. We're all here to work to make sure that happens. And anything we can do to support you, we offer our services. Mm -hmm. Thank you, doctor. All right, I'm gonna throw out a jump ball question. That means anyone jump in on this answer, all right? Um, I'm a member of the Congressional uh, FFA Caucus. Uh, my dad was an ag teacher. He led FFA, great organization. Um, I'm curious to know how each of your institutions work with youth development programs like 4-H and FFA to recruit the next generation to, to get this, um, uh, this vibe going in America again where ag is so important and we need to look to the future. Anybody? Yes, sir, Dr. Engel. Yes, just very briefly, uh, FFA state convention on our campus this week. So uh, near and dear to, uh, to all things we do in our college, and I, I think that's true at other institutions as well. 163,000 4-H members in the state. Uh, you know, these are tremendous recruiting pipelines. I would caution, though, that these are not enough. We have to grow those that are interested in agriculture to embrace others in our states and beyond. We have 30 seconds or so left. Who would like to jump in? Jump ball. <laughs> Of course, Texas has uh, one of the strongest FFA, if not the strongest FFA program in, in the nation, so we're very blessed in that regard. Uh, and I think hosting those events to make sure that those, those students are on campus is a critical opportunity for us, but also agree with, with Dr. Engel uh, that it's not just about hosting them, but it's truly connecting them again with the great opportunities that exist in agriculture, and that, that takes effort. Uh, on each of our institutions' part to be in front, uh, intentionally in front of those students to share those opportunities. Once again, I thank you so much for being here. Uh, I know it's an investment in your time and resources to be here. This committee thanks you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, next, we go to um, back to Illinois uh, with Representative Sorensen. Thank you, Chairman, uh, for having this important hearing. Also, I'd like to uh, thank the gentleman from Missouri for asking about vulnerabilities in the international space. I think that's important to talk about. Um, Land-grant universities, like the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, are responsible for about 70% of all the agricultural research in the United States. Uh, these facilities are working to develop solutions to grow nutrient-dense food fewer, with fewer resources, uh, prevent the next zoonotic uh, outbreak, and train the next generation of scientists. Um, but as we've seen mentioned here today, the disinvestment in public agriculture research uh, over the past couple of decades continues to increase pressures that are facing our producers. Um, without robust investment, uh, the agriculture sector, a bedrock of our economy, risks losing its global competitiveness and ability to adequately train the next generation of researchers and producers. Um, I hear from the, the immense importance of, for instance, the U of I extension uh, for our farmers in Western Illinois. Um, and so I'm gonna pose this to Dr. Engel. Um, I'd like to hear from you because of being a fellow Midwesterner. What keeps you up at night with respect to challenges on the horizon, with respect to ag research and how it impacts those producers in the Midwest. Yeah, thank you. I, I guess in, in my world, uh, facilities is one that keeps me up at night. Uh, yeah, we've seen tremendous escalation in costs of facilities. I'm dealing with one of those now. So that is truly one that, that I do worry about. Um, and that's probably the biggest one. So certainly more support for the base research that we do, incredibly important. Uh, you know, if we can take 
relatively small resources and do fantastic work with it, but more is better. Thank you for that. Uh, Dr. Caro, I, I appreciate, um, you know, you mentioned in your testimony um, the importance of multispectral drone in, uh, imagery. Um, I'm working in the science committee to ensure unmanned aircraft are safe, providing the right technological innovations. Um, my question to you is, what are the challenges that you are seeing today within the agriculture technology field? So from my context, uh, uh, the, the biggest challenge is, is just uh, uh, in terms of people, getting enough people uh, engaged in that space and doing the kind of work that is required. So at UMES, for example, uh, we've been, the School of Ag has been li linking with our engineering folks to really be able to implement uh, this work. And without that sort of connection, uh, we wouldn't be able to really undertake that work. Uh, the other thing is, of course, funding. Uh, we, we do need more funding uh, to support research in this space. Uh, it's a rapidly moving, moving field uh, with new things coming up uh, each and every day. Uh, I, I think uh, the way chat GPT just swept the world since November is a, is a classic example of where we need to util find ways to be able to utilize these uh, opportunities. But we, we, we lack that breath in, in people to be able to be as effective as we, we would like. How can we ensure that Congress is doing the right things addressing this in the Farm Bill? Um, so, so the, for example, uh, facilities uh, is one, uh, just one challenge that we've been uh, uh, discussing, but also being able to provide uh, uh, or ensuring the capacity funding is there to be able to allow us the breadth uh, to grow and expand our activities in some of these new fields and new areas that are becoming increasingly important. Thank you, sir, I appreciate that. Um, uh, I'd like to go to Ms. Billy next. Uh, biodiversity is such an important um, piece of a robust ecosystem. Can you tell us more about the importance of having native-specific agriculture research that takes into account the need to preserve native lands and culture? Thank you. One of the examples that I, I just gave earlier was June berries, for example. That's a, a native indigenous plant to this country. And there is a lot of work on bee, bee a lot of work being done on bee research, but bees aren't aren't indigenous to this they land. Are not. They're not a native pollinator. So tribal colleges are actually doing work to try to restore native pollinators because that's really how you, you sustain your place is by focusing on what lives and works in your place. So I think that's one thing that tribal colleges are doing. They're working on, with June berries. These are, as I said, super high concentrate, high antioxidant, high protein foods. If we could figure out a way to take that to scale, we could really solve the food challenges in this country. It's the same with bison where you use every aspect of the animal. You don't just use one part of it. There are ways that we can better use what we have here in the place that we're in. Thank you so much for, for your testimony, your participation today, and I yield back. Thank you, the gentleman yields back, and now we go to Florida with Representative Cammie. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and go Gators. <laughs> Yesterday was uh, Gator Day on the Hill, so still feeling very orange and blue and, and very proud of, of the University of Florida. Uh, very exciting to represent a land-grant university. And as many of you know, and I know you guys have great pride in the institutions that you all represent, but uh, for us, we are very proud of our rich heritage of agricultural research and outreach that spans over a century. Nestled in the heart of one of the most diverse and productive agricultural regions in the United States, the university has embraced its unique position to address the specific challenges and opportunities facing Florida's agricultural industry. Indeed, we're home to over 300 specialty crops, and I am extraordinarily proud that we rank top five for cow-calf producers in the country, and uh, it still astounds me where we rank one, two, and three when it comes to some of these specialty crops. But as such, that requires tremendous research and development to make sure that these uh, commodities stay viable for the future. So as agriculture has 
really evolved into a high-tech space. I wanted to just kind of uh, dive into this. Um, Dr. Engel, you, you kind of touched on one of the issues from one of my colleagues was asking about China and Brazil and India, but I wanted to follow up on that, that line of questioning they were going down. So outside of protecting our competitive edge in regards to ag, the U.S. population is projected to grow from 336 million people in 2023 to 373 million in 2053. The global population is projected to grow from 8 billion people to 9 billion by 2050. With this rapid rate of growth in population, isn't there a need for ag research to address this and the potential for food security issues that will come with needing to feed that many more people? I think we all know the answer to this, but just for the record. <laughs> the short answer is yes. And uh, you know, as, as land grant institutions, we're working on this problem. Uh, you know, we're working to ensure that we accelerate the productivity of plants, that their efficiencies, uh, the same in the animal space as well. So, you know, additional resources to ensure that we're continuing to make that progress at the pace that you point out is going to be needed is absolutely critical. Thank you. And this could be Dr. Ulrich or Ulrich? Urich. Urich. I was way off. <laughs> Close enough. <laughs> Good enough for government work, I Good suppose. Good enough for government work. In your testimony, you write about citrus greening disease and the devastating impact that this disease has on the citrus industry. This isn't just a Florida problem, but we're seeing this across the industry as a whole. As a member of the Sunshine State, I have personally seen the devastating impacts where we have gone from 250 million boxes in the early 2000s to now about 30 thousand boxes in production. You mentioned specifically the emergency citrus disease research and the extension program, which has been implemented to combat citrus greening. Now, as we look to draft the Farm Bill this year, can you speak to the importance of maintaining this important program, specifically the need to continue funding? Because as we all know, research is not something you can turn on and off like a light switch. It requires that continual investment. Do you see light at the end of the tunnel? And can you speak to that importance? Yes, I see light at the end of the tunnel. There's a lot we can do. Um, we brought up this before. Having that continued research over long term, particularly for trees, which take decades to mature, is extremely important for this process. So as you know, citrus greening disease is devastating. Not just in Florida, we're very concerned about this, about this in California. And we use all the tools in the toolbox that we can have, from high-end genomic sequencing to splicing, um, you know, uh, um, and, and plant breeding, everything that we can have that we can possibly do to make sure that the disease does not affect California and the rest of the country we're working on. And it is a long-term plan. And if it's not citrus, it could be citrus screening disease this day, but it might be something else for peaches and almonds and pistachios in the future. So I know I'm coming short on time, but one word answers down the panel, and my, my team is going to be terrified that I go off script. Talking about GMOs, mm -hmm. right, and the need for us to continually develop research and solve some of these, these uh, pressing issues with things like CRISPR technology, do you support the use and further development of GMOs, and do you believe that there is a problem with people understanding what they are and they aren't. Going down the line, I'll start with you. <laughs> Do people understand what they are? I don't know if people, un everybody understands what they are and they aren't. I'll get back to, I think we need to use every tool in the toolbox that we have. Perfect. Because again, we need to make sure our food is safe, secure, and abundant. Thank you. Congratulations on the recent national championship. <laughs> Thank uh, you. Yeah, ab absolutely. Uh, GMOs are an important tool in the toolbox for all things food security and safety. Um, and um, would, would definitely support their use and believe that we could do a better job of communicating what they are and what they aren't with the general public. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just say ditto. We, Perfect. People don't know. <laughs> I know, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm running really, really short on time. I totally agree with my colleagues. Perfect, thank you. I, I agree too. They're an important tool that we need to use to address these major challenges. Perfect, thank you, last one. Incredibly important tool in my written testimony, I talk about a 40% increase in pods on soybeans as a result of the technology. Uh, we need that help. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, let the record reflect the entire panel agreed with the Gator Nation. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> with that, I yield back. <laughs> Thank you, and we'll, we'll discuss that issue after the meeting, okay? <laughs> anyway. Thank anyway. you all so much. Thank you.
Next, we go to Representative Miller. Thank you, Chairman Baird and Ranking Member Spanberger, and thank you for holding this hearing to review vital research initiatives to strengthen and sustain American agriculture. Agriculture research is key to providing the tools for farms and livestock producers to remain competitive in the global marketplace, create efficiencies in farm production, and meet growing food security demands. Earlier this year, I had the opportunity to view firsthand important agricultural research initiatives undertaken in my district at the Worcester campus of Ohio State's University's College of Food, Agriculture, and Environmental Sciences. State-of-the-art research endeavors by this land-grant institution include the Application Technology Research Unit, which utilizes innovative technologies such as first-in-the-nation intelligent spray technology, allowing for more efficient agricultural production, reduced targeted use of pesticide applications, lower production costs, higher yields, lower labor costs, and benefits to the environment. Ohio State is also pursuing an ag tech innovation nexus to advance science and training for next generation leaders for agriculture and maintain a competitive advantage globally in food production through agriculture technology. Additional Ohio State initiatives include fostering space-focused agricultural research recognized as vital through my work on the Science, Space, and Technology Committee under the leadership of my good colleague, Chairman Lucas, over there to my right. United States agriculture must have access to advanced technologies to compete in the global market, particularly given rising input, labor, and environmental regulatory challenges. That is why I'm proud to join my colleagues on the committee and Doug LaMalfa, subcommittee ranking member Spanberger, and salute Carbajal in introducing the Mechanization Automation Accelerated Research and Development Program to promote advanced technologies for more efficient agricultural production, including the use of automation and mechanical harvesting. The legislation emphasizes innovation and technology through multidisciplinary, multi-institutional approaches that allow for public and private research institutions and partnerships with industry. To any of the witnesses, how can private and public-based research serve to prepare students for the technology-driven careers of the future in agriculture? In addition, how can private slash public partnerships enhance the land-grant mission to re-equip farmers and agricultural professionals with new technologies to increase agricultural output and efficiency? For anyone who would like to jump in. Yes, ha happy to jump in. Uh, you know, my institution, Purdue University, and, and I believe the others here as well, we work every day with industry in these private-public relationships. It's great for moving research ahead. It's great for moving products ultimately to the marketplace. It's great for developing talent who are going to be employed by those industries and beyond. Uh, we need to continue to do more of that. Uh, it's a great way to conduct research and get it to the marketplace. Thank you. I, I would also add that um, as, as we've designed new facilities and had the opportunities to renovate and, and construct new facilities, we're de designing them with industry partnerships in mind. So for an example, uh, we about 10 years ago designed a new uh, 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 building to support our food systems and technology and biological systems engineering department. And in that facility, we designed pilot labs that would allow industries to come in and set up their equipment. And, um, and it also gives the students an opportunity to work closely with those corporate partners and learn a bit about corporate life and the challenges and the real problems that they're having and how to uh, uh, find solutions to real industry problems. So I, I think that's a, 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 another way to uh, engage the industry in supporting our students. Absolutely, and I could not agree more. We must prepare for the next generation of agricultural leaders with the skills and advanced technologies to meet tomorrow's farm production challenges. It was my privilege to tour Ohio State University's Agricultural Technical Institute, which provides hands-on agricultural educational programs from dairy, swine, and equine to horticulture as the largest institution of its kind in the United States. To any of the witnesses, once again, can you please expand upon the importance of land-grant institutions in equipping students to meet the agricultural challenges of tomorrow, including their role in training students to deploy advanced agricultural innovations, as well as technical hands-on training skills to carry out such advancements to create efficiencies to best compete in the global marketplace? I'm going to 
take the privilege of being the last one in line. <laughs> um, one of the things that we've been think talking about a lot is specific technologies, which I'm a big fan of, but I also i am thinking, reflecting on the question of what keeps me up at night, and that is the future, future farmers. Who are the future farmers? Who are the future innovators? And there's something that's already embedded in the Farm Bill, and that is related to the Education Grants Program for Hispanic Serving Institutes, as well as expanding and building capacity for the Hisaku programs. This is an important venue for us for developing the future farmers' educational programs and these outreach programs. Thank you. And Mr. Chairman, my time is up, and I yield. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, next we go to um, South Car or North Carolina, I'm sorry, uh, Representative Adams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you to the ranking member as well uh, for, for this hearing, and thank you for allowing me to, uh, to be here today and to the, to the witnesses. Uh, thank you for your testimony, uh, and, and thank you, Dean Cairo, uh, for your testimony on Title VII, particularly as it relates to HBCUs in the 1890s specifically. It's an important topic that we cannot talk enough about, uh, especially as we're working toward crafting the, the text for the Farm Bill. I am a proud graduate twice of an 1890 North Carolina A&T State University. Um, I, um, I, I spent uh, 40 years as a college professor at Bennett College on an HBCU and received uh, my PhD from The Ohio State University, but only because of the North Carolina A&T and HBCU, so I want to put that out there. Uh, but let me just, um, before I get to my questions, I do want to just speak about the Centers of Excellence um, authorized in the previous Farm Bill and the opportunities to build on them. Uh, because the Centers of Excellence at 1890s increase the, the research capacity of these institutions and, and lead to more innovative, creative solutions uh, to our nation's most pressing uh, agricultural challenges. And as you mentioned in your testimony, Dr. Carroll, these centers play an important role in increasing diversity in the STEM pipeline and increase opportunities in underserved farming communities. And so the footprint of the center at UMES is truly impressive. Uh, because of its level of student engagement and its direct connection and relation to farmers. And that's why this week I'm excited to introduce with partners in the House and Senate the Enable Opportunity Act of 2023, which expands the number of 1890 centers of excellence from six to 10, um, reauthorizing their funding for the next five years. Uh, so let me ask you, I've heard specifically from our 1890s that in administering both the scholarship program and the Centers of Excellence, that there are challenges uh, with administrative costs being able to be deducted. Is there something that you're seeing at your university? If you would just speak briefly to that. Uh, thank you very much for that question. And uh, thank you for, for all you've done for the 1890 universities. Um, so for the scholarships program, uh, we sort of started implementing that program and it's really gained traction. Uh, at UMES this year, we're gonna turn away uh, nearly 400, over 400 uh, students who are qualified uh, for the program, but where we do not have resources. But I think one of our challenges is just the administration of the program. One of our goals, uh, one of the primary goals with the program was to ensure that students are graduating on time, uh, we are supporting them, linking them with industry, and without uh, support at the administrative uh, level, uh, it becomes fairly difficult. So the program does offer uh, funds that go directly to students, which is great, but it would be also be great if uh, uh, some flexibility could be allowed so that we can support some of the recruitment and some of these student support uh, services so we can do an even greater job of ensuring the students get the best experience and that they are graduating uh, right on time and getting out to, 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 to the economy. So in terms of the Small Farms Program, which is an excellent resource for, for local and underserved farmers, how do you see additional research funding here improving this program? So for, for uh, small farm programs are particularly critical for us because they really allow us to directly serve uh, a clientele who really have uh, been uh, severely underserved. So I think uh, uh, any additional resources 
that would allow us to be more impactful. I mean, right now we are looking at the impacts of climate change, for example, and how it affects uh, this group of people and, and uh, asking the question, what can we do to be able to support them to be much more effective from the kind of cropping systems or any of the other related activities. So I think more funding would allow us to be more impactful and support a greater number. Great. Well, thank you very much, and thank you to all the witnesses. And I am HBCU strong uh, and um, want to continue to make sure that our schools not only survive, but that they thrive. So thank you all for the work that you do, Madam, Ch uh, uh, Madam Ranking Member. And Mr. Chair, thank you for allowing me to be here. Thank you. The lady, general lady yields back. And uh, you know, now it's my pleasure to introduce a colleague uh, from Oklahoma, and he's chairman of the uh, Science, Space, and Technology Committee. But if you look up here on the wall, his picture was he's involved with, uh, involved with the Ag Committee in the past, and he really understands he's uh, dedicated to science and research. And so with that, I give you uh, Representative Lucas. Thank you, Chairman Baird, and thank you, Ranking Member, for holding this hearing today. And I, I apologize for being a little late. As Dr. Baird noted, I have the honor and privilege and responsibility of chairing the Science, Space, and Technology Committee, as well as being a member of the glorious and all-important Agriculture Committee. Uh, one of the things that I've had the opportunity to work on for a long time, and Dr. Baird, you are also a member of the Science Committee, and I appreciate your labors there too. Long before I was chairman of the full committee, I chaired 20 years ago the subcommittee with jurisdiction over research. And that was my first opportunity to really appreciate how complicated the research missions of the universities were, the land grants also, and the Ag Research Service. Having access to the kind of infrastructure, the kind of resources that create the opportunities that attract the bright and brilliant science minds in this country, it's just, it's very important. So having just now come from a markup on the Science Committee, I'd like to visit with uh, the panel about not just the traditional resources through the Ag Committee, but about the opportunities for funding exist in other federal agencies, uh, specifically the National Science Foundation and the Department of Energy. Can, can, you, can the panel speak to the importance of this kind of funding and the challenges in competing for that? And I'd also welcome your thoughts uh, about how they, those other resources may potentially complement and in some ways differ from the programs administered by USDA. Yeah, that's a broad question, but you're a bright bunch. <laughs> Let me quickly address that. Um, so NSF is about 11 percent of, of the work in, in research in agriculture at Purdue over the last four years. Uh, DOE, if I recall correctly, is 5 or 6 percent. Uh, these are critical to us because they're often very complementary and they allow us to take a longer term view, given the, the scope and, and mission of those agencies, to think about further into the future some of the research we need to be doing. So they're important. We hope those uh, continue to be great assets for us as well. It's a very good question. I, I would like to add to that that uh, at Virginia Tech and the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences, USDA competitive funding is a large portion of our research portfolio, but um, what that has allowed us to do is make our faculty very competitive for other federal agency funds. For example, National Institute of Health. So when you think about a lot of the food and ag research, it also involves a fair amount of human health issues and nutrition issues. Um, and NIH is, is very interested in funding that type of research. So um, we have a number of faculty in, in our college um, that um, rely on NIH funding. Um, in addition to the NSF and, and DOE funding and so forth. Anyone else? I, I'd like, could I just add that I think they, those other agencies do, are important to this endeavor, but there is a lack of coordination among the agencies, and I think that this committee could do a lot to encourage USDA to work more proactively, with, particularly with NSF and the National and NIH, and to allow more coordination of grants. They're very concerned about double dipping, which is important, you don't wanna do that, but not to the extent that it doesn't allow collaboration. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
Thanks for the question. NSF helped uh, Davis College and the College of Engineering at Texas Tech University lift up the Center for Advancement of Sustainable Fertilizer. Of course, that uh, NSF required a, a match, and the state was willing, and the university were willing to partner uh, with those two colleges on that effort. So they're critically important because what that does is allows us to leverage private partners that are developing technologies in that space and thinking about infrastructure that allows us to develop space for those new startup companies to apply those technologies and build those out. Uh, either they succeed or they fail. Um, so they're critically important to us. I'd say the other, the other uh, comment or relative to NIH uh, is linking animal health with human health with environmental health. And so those programs that are joint, especially in our case between animal and human, uh, are very efficacious where there's dual application for both of those models. Uh, as an inventor and entrepreneur myself, I would uh, appreciate uh, USDA modeling some of the programs for NIH and NSF that develop innovation, specifically the NSF i program, which trains people to be innovators and start their own companies, as well as NIH's SBIR programs, a small business. Um, uh, they have phase zero, phase one, and phase two, which takes innovations, inventions that are occurring in our laboratories and moving them out and working with companies to really actually make it happen to implement those technologies. And I see that as an important space for USDA to move into also. If the chairman will just indulge me for a minute more. We have worked for some time, whether it is the concept of quote, rule STEM, through the science committee programs or our efforts here in ag, to try and make sure that every available opportunity is there for all of our neighbors out in rural America who are involved in production agriculture making sure that you have access, not just to things traditionally in your lane, but other research opportunities just maximizes uh, everybody's future uh, back home, and for that matter of fact, the benefit of it. So, Mr. Chairman, I thank you and the ranking member for the hearing today. This really is an outstanding panel and sounds like uh, they're on track. We just need to help them down that track a little faster. And I yield back. Thank you, Representative Lucas. It's a pleasure to have you here and have you working with us with your background and experience. Uh, now, the witnesses, at this point, you can relax because uh, we have some formalities that we do to finish up and close this meeting. So just want you to give you a chance to relax. You've had two hours. Uh, and so at this point, I'd like to give the ranking, ranking I'm sorry, Ranking member came talk. You know, anyway, the ranking member the opportunity for any closing remarks that she might have. Mr. Chairman, thank you for convening this hearing. It has been a wonderful discussion. To our witnesses, thank you for being here today. Um, and I, I really appreciate the testimony uh, that you gave, all of your work uh, when you are not with us here in the halls of Congress. Um, I think you've helped provide a strong understanding of why the important programs that are part of the Farm Bill um, are vital to our communities. Uh, Dean Grant, thank you for your work at Virginia Tech um, on behalf of your students and Virginia Agriculture. And I just want to reiterate my continued support for making strong investments in research. Certainly the numbers bear out the importance, but your testimony here today uh, conveys what those numbers actually mean and what those results can be. Thank you for your good work on behalf of uh, American agriculture um, and the farmers and producers who engage every day. Um, in our Farm Bill, we must ensure that our universities have the funding they need to continue the good work that you all are doing, promote U.S. global competitiveness, um, and ensure cutting-edge research to strengthen our food systems and our resiliency. So thank you all for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Mr. Chairman, thank you for the hearing, and I yield back. Well, thank you, Ranking Member. appreciate your presence here. And uh, I really want to really make sure that you understand how much we appreciate all of you as witnesses being here today. Your testimony and your expertise is really beneficial for helping us to make the decisions we make about legislation. So, so to, to, to continue with that, uh, earlier this Congress, we held a hearing to review the USDA research programs, and today provided us with an opportunity to hear directly from those universities receiving funds from capacity funding and competitive grant program in the research title. 
So I'd like to thank all of you witnesses again and add my thank you for you being here and sharing your expertise with the members of this subcommittee. I know we all have greatly appreciated the opportunity to spend more time reviewing research programs and the implementation of the research title in the Farm Bill. And I'd like to thank the ranking member, Spanberger, for her comments and questions and for her strong support of agricultural research. We cannot forget about the importance of agricultural research in ensuring the United States continues to have the safest, most abundant, and most affordable food and fiber supply in the world. Continued American leadership in ag research is critical national importance, both domestically and abroad. Under the rules of the committee, the record of today's hearing will remain open for 10 calendar days so that we can have and receive additional material and supplementary written responses from the witnesses to any question posed by a member. And this hearing of the Subcommittee on Conservation, Research, and Biotechnology is adjourned. <laughs>